Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our session. We're going to be talking today about uh, integrating Cloud Foundry with NSX. Uh, we're going to be talking about a number of different things related to Cloud Foundry, NSXV, and NSXT. Um, just to warn you, there are no emojis or GIFs in this presentation. I see a couple of people getting ready to leave. Please don't. Uh, <laughs> we promise it'll be fun. Um, so what? before we jump into the presentation, we just had a couple of quick questions. How many of you here are deploying uh, and using Cloud Foundry? OK, wow, that's a, that's a good number. And how many of you are already using NSXV? See a few hands go up. And how many of you are, I guess no one's really already deployed NSXT, but how many of you are looking forward to the integration of um, PCF with NSXT? Great. Wow, this is really awesome. You should follow up with. There was a question. Perfect. So the question was, what is V and what is T? And we will cover this through our presentation. Sure. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll know what the difference is between NSX, V, and T. So my name is Usha Ramachandran. I am a product manager at Pivotal, and I focus on uh, networking on Cloud Foundry. And I'm joined by Sai Chaitanya, who is the product line manager for uh, NSX, uh, and he's, he's from VMware. So this is just a disclaimer that we had to put. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is, is walking you through just an introduction of Cloud Foundry. I know several of you all, since you have deployed Cloud Foundry, uh, some of the things I'm going to cover in the introduction you may already know. Um, but this is just to set the stage for uh, the integration and how it actually works. Uh, and then we'll get into um, what have we done with NSXV? What are some of the new features in networking on Cloud Foundry? And uh, then we'll finally end with the NSXT integration um, and a demo of the integration as well. So it should be a good session. So let's start with just understanding the, a couple of different personas that we were looking at um, when we were talking about um, what, what, what these personas might want out of a networking solution. So from an operator perspective, uh, we're really looking at platform stability as being like a, a, a big concern that your platform is for the most part up and running, that patches are easy, and your day two operations are, are smooth. Uh, the second thing that we hear a lot about is security. And a lot of what we're doing with NSX integrating uh, NSX into the container networking stack is around security. So um, making sure that you have network security, uh, authorization, authentication, and then just overall platform platform security as well. Um, and then finally, visibility. So being able to log stuff, uh, being able to triage stuff, uh, debug things. So all of these things are uh, things that we've kept in mind as, as we've done this integration. Um, the, one of the main um, users of Cloud Foundry is actually the application developer, right? Like, and, and there's a big focus on um, making sure that the app developer experience is, is really good and smooth. Um, so from a, for an app developer, um, really trying to just help them focus on business logic, um, you know, the platform should try and automate a lot of the stuff so that the, the app developer doesn't have to worry about this stuff. Um, supporting different application types. Um, so when we started off, we, we were looking mostly at microservice apps, but there are also other types of apps, like clustering apps that have perhaps different communication requirements. Um, and then latency sensitive or like highly secure applications. Um, and then finally, just speed and, secure, speed and agility. Um, if you want to open up a firewall rule, you probably don't want to wait for a week to file a ticket and then you know, have, have your firewall rule um, opened up for you, right? So just keeping the app developer unblocked. So I'm going to just do a very quick technical primer on, on PCF. And I'm going to focus on the parts of PCF that are, that are relevant to uh, what we've done uh, with NSXT. Of course, this is very, very high level, and it's not at all complete. Um, but it's just to give you an idea of you know, what are the different steps that happen. So when, it, when someone pushes an app through using CF push, uh, it basically talks to the Cloud Foundry API, which is essentially uh, provided by Cloud Controller. 
from Cloud Controller, um, the, 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 the actual app is sent to Diego, where Diego is our uh, container orchestration uh, engine, and, and that'll basically say, hey, which, you know, which cells or VMs can I run these apps on? Um, at that point, the app is scheduled to a cell. So when we say um, that an app is scheduled to a cell, it's basically uh, a stateless app, and all your state is basically persisted in some um, off-platform uh, stateful service. What happens after this is that that app is going to get registered with the Go router um, with, with a specific name, and then when a user accesses it, it's going to go you know, through the load balancer to the Go router um, to the cell, and then if there's, if there's a need to access external services, um, then those are accessed by the app as well. A couple of important things here to understand is that the, the, the communication for an app is basically using NAT or network address translation. So traditionally, um, application instances on Cloud Foundry uh, didn't have their own container IP, and all your traffic going out would basically be NATed when, when you sent it out. Um, so we'll, like, all of this basically relates to how NSXT comes in and changes uh, some of this flow as well. Um, to start with, the typical network security on Cloud Foundry was uh, using application security groups. How many of you here use application security groups? Cool. Um, so application security groups, if you're familiar with them, are basically just a collection of egress rules. Um, and these egress rules are basically saying that, oh, um, uh, a specific space or my entire foundation can talk to a set of um, CIDR or IP ranges, right? Um, they are applied to uh, a container when it starts up. So if you change an ASG, then you have to restage your apps. So there, there are a couple of like um, unique things about ASGs, and they, they, they pose some challenges to operators. Uh, the first one is that they're pretty coarse grained, so you you will apply them at either the entire um, you know space level or the entire foundation level, and in addition to being uh, coarse grained, they they're only network policies, so they only apply to your networking rules, and there's no actual like isolation um, between your actual containers. And we'll talk more about what this means um, when we talk about the integration with NSXV and isolation segments. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sai now, and he's going to talk about the NSXV integration. Sure. Thank you, Usha. So I think a good starting point is to kind of talk about what NSX is and what the difference between V and T is, right? Uh, NSX is a network and security virtualization platform. What it does is it provides networking and security features uh, all implemented in software, right? And think of this as features like firewalling, uh, connectivity in the form of routers and like logical layer two networks, load balancers, and even VPN devices. So NSX has been out there in the market for like more than four years. It all started with the acquisition of NYSERA at VMware. And for the first four years of, of us are being in like in the market, what we've actually done is provide these type of services, networking and security services, primarily only to vSphere based environments, right? So this essentially means that if you had a bunch of ESXi hosts, you could actually run like routing services on, on some of those ESXi hosts. And all through the goal was really to kind of build a model where you actually distribute services as much as possible to, to the edge, right? So instead of having like a centralized uh, router and a centralized firewall, what uh, NSX did is it basically made the ESX hypervisor also like a network appliance. So there are a bunch of services that run in a completely distributed fashion. However, we still have some services which are like more meaningful to run in a centralized fashion. So while we've done this for about four years, uh, right uh, from late 2012, um, what we're now starting to see is the need for providing some of these capabilities uh, beyond vSphere. So we see a lot of customers deploying applications on other infrastructure, like on-premise, on, on it could be bare metal, it could be KVM, but there's a lot of customers who are deploying infrastructure on public clouds, like Amazon and Azure. So, as a network and security virtualization platform whose goal is to kind of connect all applications, there's a need for NSX to be uh, provide its capabilities beyond vSphere. 
and that's where NSXT comes comes in, right? NSXT basically T stands for an internal engineering project name called Transformers, but NSXT is NSX's means to providing networking and security for traditional apps, which are VM-based applications, and cloud-native apps, apps running on Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, on any infrastructure, vSphere, KVM, and other public cloud infrastructure, okay? So what we'll talk about now is basically the integration of NSX uh, and Cloud Foundry in the context of NSXV, right? So NSXV, as I said, has been out there for quite some time. We had a bunch of people who've deployed it here. So we wanted to kind of talk about like the integration that exists today between NSXV and, and uh, as a good first step before we talk about NSXT. So while VMware is investing in NSXT to build this multi-hypervisor, multi-cloud platform that is cloud native, right? Built ground up for cloud native. There's also certain benefits that exist when customers use PCF on top of NSX V infrastructure, okay? So let's start by looking at networking, right? So from a networking standpoint, every Pivotal Cloud Foundry deployment typically requires like at least three networks, like an infra network, uh, deployment network and a services network, right? So these are networks for your Digo cells, networks for your VMs, uh, and a management network. What we've seen that is the experience of installing Cloud Foundry when done on a public cloud is extremely smooth and agile because you're essentially interfacing with the cloud with APIs, right? So you're using Amazon APIs or Azure APIs. But when this, when this is done on private cloud infrastructure and more particularly legacy infrastructure, this essentially means that these are all basically uh, done ma through manual provisioning. You typically call the network team and you ask them for these networks, you ask for some load balancing configuration. This is all basically taking a lot of time in terms of just the time to bring up a foundation. So while Cloud Foundry can kind of push an app like in seconds, the moment the foundation is up, sometimes just the time to bring up a foundation is extremely uh, time taking. So that's where network automation and software defined networks that NSX can provide have a lot of value, right? So we've, there's a good body of knowledge of a lot of customers deploying PCF on NSXV out there, but what they end up doing typically is create these software networks. These are software networks that span a bunch of ESX hosts where your uh, PCF foundation is going to reside. So in addition to base networking, right, uh, NSX has an edge device, and the edge device is, think of it as a VM-based router, which can also do load balancing in a firewall. It's called ESG, which stands for Edge Services Gateway. What, in addition, what, what's needed basically beyond this base networks uh, is also routing and uh, connectivity to the rest of the infrastructure. So that's where the ESG and its routing capabilities come into picture. So we actually, the most common pattern for deploying uh, PCF that we've seen is deploying a bunch of NSX virtual networks uh, and behind an NSX edge, and then running NAT on the NSX edge. The idea really is to kind of hide these networks behind like an NSX edge and not really consume uh, network address space from your underlying data center routed infrastructure, right? What this gives you is as you kind of grow multiple foundations, you can have like a very cookie cutter approach where you can actually just uh, run some automation to create these software-defined networks, right? There's a concourse pipeline for uh, creating these networks and creating the ESG infrastructure. So benefit is basically completely automated infrastructure deployment. So, and we also spoke a little about NAT, which is basically the ability to hide all of this PCF infrastructure behind like one uh, boundary, right, the, behind the NSX edge. So there's also some amount of load balancing that is required for uh, every PCF deployment, right? So for all of your infrastructure, the Go router is, is the typical entry point into the infrastructure, and you typically deploy some form of a load balancer in front of the Go router. So while some customers do this in the form of using like an F5 to configure load balancing, for some customers, they, uh, we have a lot of customers who actually deployed NSX Edge as a load balancer as well. So the idea is you have a completely automated process that you can use to configure uh, these software-defined networks, the router with NAT, and also load balancing. So this gives you a model where you can actually have, like if, if, if the PaaS team wants to kind of manage the entire infrastructure, the PaaS team basically can just ask for some bunch of IP addresses from the uh, infrastructure team, and at that point, you're completely off the, off, uh, off the hook to kind of go and create your own uh, load balancers and create your own routers and bring up your infrastructure. 
So this has given like freedom to a lot of teams where they're actually able to kind of move much faster than what some of the traditional infrastructure teams have allowed them to do. In addition to providing base networking and security, uh, networking and load balancing, there's also the idea of basically um, security. And when you think about security, you gotta think about it both in terms of platform security and application security. So NSX has uh, two, far, two security enforcement points, right? So remember I spoke when I said earlier, we try to distribute services as much as we can, uh, but certain services we, try, we run it in a centralized fashion. Tying that back here, we have what's called like an edge firewall. So the NSX edge services gateway, it's in addition to doing routing, NAT, and load balancing, also can do firewall. So think of it as a perimeter firewall that you would configure uh, at, at, like at, the, at the front of the foundation, right? So I'll then introduce the distributed firewall in, in some time later, which is more kind of used in the context of application security. So if you're trying to protect your PCF and platform, right, or just doing platform security, NSX Edge Firewall is a very good place to do platform security, okay? So there's a, well, uh, there's a cookbook that is kind of defining the base set of uh, security rules that you want to configure on your NSX environment to get platform security. So I'll now move on to the concept of like how you can get some level of segmentation or security for an app running on Cloud Foundry uh, using NSXV. So just to keep in mind that at some point I'll be talking about NSXT and NSXT is what really, really integrates with Cloud Foundry to give you like container or microservice level security. NSXV does offer some benefits. It gives you, it gives you the ability to do coarser level security and we'll look at how that can be done. It's basically being done using a feature uh, that's based on isolation segments in Cloud Foundry. So Cloud Foundry's isolation segment feature basically gives you the ability to uh, have the Cloud Foundry control plane uh, place applications on different sets of Diego cells, right? So if you have like so one application that is um, having like a PCI compliant app, right, or that needs that where that needs segmentation, and another application which is more internal intranet apps, right. What customers did in the past when they didn't have these type of features, they had created multiple foundations. So when you create multiple foundations, that uh, adds complexity for platform operators to install, upgrade, you know, just uh, keep them up and going. So isolation segments is a good way to use a single foundation to use to have and have like different classes of applications. Right? So the idea really comes with the ability to do placement control. So if you can define an isolation segment and then, and then assign this to an org or space, anytime you deploy an application in that specific org or space, you get your own dedicated set of cells, Diego cells. Right? And what that gives you is compute level isolation. So you're able to kind of say, you know, my, set, my PCI apps or my apps for a specific group in, inside my company is in its own bubble of uh, Diego cells. So, so it basically makes the life of platform operators more simple by giving you the ability to use shared foundations. While Cloud Foundry isolation segment gives you compute level isolation, where we kind of saw value with by doing some NSX integration was to do network level segmentation, right? So a lot of customers wanted to ha also have the ability to kind of say isolate these apps from different teams or like uh, different security profiles, uh, even at the network level. And that's where basically the integration of uh, isolation segments and NSXV security groups comes into picture. So what we've done is really the ability to kind of add basically Diego cells that are part of an isolation segment to an NSX security group, right? So the idea is you would have a security group for retail and security group for maybe like say investment banking, and then anytime you deploy apps to these two different isolation seg uh, segments, those, those VMs are always being added to some pre-created NSX security group. So the integration is via, via Ops Manager. So anytime you go in Ops Manager and try to provision a isolation segment, you basically can specify an NSX security group name. And all the cells that are being provisioned for that isolation segment at that time and throughout the life cycle of that isolation segment are always kind of added into the NSX security group. So what this gives you is basically an ability to do grouping of a bunch of Diego cells. And the NSX security group can also become a means where you can actually define some form of firewall rules on the security group. 
So you can basically say, I have this uh, isolation segment for investment back, it goes into this NSX uh, security group that's for this part of the business, and this, all apps that go into this security group can access certain resources, maybe a database that's meant for that group or line of business. So this basically gives you network level isolation of applications, but at a much more coarser level, right? Because the isolation segment can be defined and, uh, and assigned at an org or a space level. So the typical workflow for doing something like this might be you know, to configure a policy on NSX. So the NSX manager gives you the ability to create security groups and firewall rules. And once you create these firewall rules on NSX, what you're going to do is you're going to go and to ops manager and create like an isolation segment. When you, and when you create the isolation segment, you can actually up, uh, refer to like a pre-existing uh, security group name in NSX. And what that does is it applies like all of these rules uh, that, have, that, that the operator has defined earlier. So a typical example is I have this PCI app. It can only access PCI services network. And I have a non-PCI isolation segment, non-PCI NSX security group. It can access a similar non-PCI services group. So it gives you some course level segmentation, right? So that's the benefit of NSX V in the context of PCF, right? Network automation, load balancing for the Go routers, NAT in the form of uh, the ESG configuration, and some level of security benefits in the form of platform security and uh, course level or or space level security. I'll hand it back to Usha now to talk about some of the enhancements done in Cloud Foundry because customers wanted more deeper security. Thanks, Sai. Um, are there any questions so far? Right. We, we will also take questions at the end. Um, we're going to slightly change focus and talk about some of the new things that we've done in Cloud Foundry networking and how that's enabled us to integrate with NSXT. Um, and so, the, the thing to note here is that NSXV is, is what, we, what was covered so far. NSXT is a new platform that has built-in container networking, which is what we're uh, integrating with uh, right now. So let's start with just kind of um, a, a look again at the current state of um, Cloud Foundry networking or what has traditionally been Cloud Foundry networking. Um, so typically in Cloud Foundry, if you had an app container, um, that app container didn't actually have its own IP address. It would use the host's IP um, and a NATed port when you had to send traffic out. Um, as a result of that, any traffic that's actually um, reaching to the destination is, you know, the, the identity of the, the, the source app is actually completely lost because the only thing you know is that this is my cell IP and this is a NATed address. In addition, um, I covered this in one of my earlier slides, which was we have ASGs as this way to apply security, but ASGs are really coarse-grained and they are egress-only rules. So if you apply an ASG, you can be satisfied that no bad traffic is leaving, but there's no way to enforce policy on the ingress. So if you had some kind of sensitive service, um, then you would have to actually, um, you know, just trust that everything that's coming in is, is, you know, has already been policed on the egress direction. So these were a couple of different challenges that we heard from customers as well as that we saw uh, with the current uh, implementation of Cloud Foundry networking. Uh, another aspect um, that is sort of evident in this diagram is that any traffic between two app containers, even if they're on uh, the same Diego cell uh, actually has to go all the way out through the router and the load balancer. So if you think about uh, latency sensitive apps um, or apps that have like specific security requirements, um, this current model was not really satisfying all those types of apps. So what we really wanted uh, was a way for your apps to talk directly to each other um, and to be able to configure more fine-grained policy. So to be able to configure, say that app A can talk to app B, but app C cannot talk to uh, app D or app B. So basically having application level policies that are not really tied to just IP addresses, because the whole thing about 
a, a, a container-based platform is that your IPs are completely eph ephemeral. Um, so if you configure a rule based on an IP, that rule's gonna, be have, gonna have to be changed if that, if that container is brought down and brought up somewhere else. Um, so this was just, just, just some of the desires of what we wanted. Um, what we have now is with PCF 1.11, uh, we do have a completely new networking stack that's, that's been shipping. Um, we started off with open source Cloud Foundry and that's been shipping since November of last year. Uh, but we went GA um, with, with PCF 1.11. And the basic features uh, in PCF 1.11 with the new networking stack are firstly, we have a new connectivity model for all our apps. Um, so what that means is that we now have, um, we've adopted a standard, which is the CNI standard. Uh, CNI stands for Container Network Interface. Um, and this, this is what actually enables us to go and you know, have NSX uh, plug into Cloud Foundry or like any other third party plugin. Um, so we also built our own batteries included plugin, uh, which is called Silk. Silk is basically a VXLAN based overlay. Um, what that means is that instead of having um, IP addresses on your physical network, all your containers get a unique IP address on uh, an overlay network that's its own network. And we'll talk more about this in the subsequent slides. So that's the connectivity piece of it. Um, so going from a model where your container had no identity outside of the host, you now have an actual IP uh, that can be associated with that container. The second aspect of what we built was app-to-app -app policies. Um, so ASGs are still there, but we, we do have app-to-app -app policies now. And by this, you can apply dynamic policies uh, to allow two Cloud Foundry apps to talk to each other. Um, there's CLI and API support, as well as support for self-service policy config. Um, so what we found is there are some environments where the operator wants to configure all the policies, but then there are some environments where the developer, the app developer is really enabled to configure their own uh, security policies. So we support both models. Um, everything else um, in the networking stack remains the same though. Um, we still have access to external entities using um, the, the cell IP and NAT as well as uh, coming in through the Go router, also using the cell IP and NAT, and ASGs continue to exist. Um, we'll see in the NSX case that this is slightly different uh, just because of the capabilities that NSXT provides, uh, where you, you no longer even need to do NAT at, uh, for egress traffic. Um, you, can, you can basically have identity for, for a container um, all the way to the container. So um, we, we'll talk about that more when we get to the NSXT part of the presentation. Um, so I just quickly wanted to introduce what CNI is. Um, so CNI is basically um, a standard set of APIs that enable a container runtime to have a pluggable networking stack. So um, by standardizing these APIs, you can have many different plugins with different uh, capabilities come and plug in. So for example, Silk is a VXLAN-based overlay. You could have something like Calico, which is like a, a basic IP. Um, you know, every single container gets an IP on the underlay itself. Um, or you could have something like NSX, NSXT, uh, where you also get an IP uh, on an NSXT network. Right? So it, it opens up a world of possibilities and um, the ability to have many different types of SDN vendors come and uh, provide advanced capabilities. Um, so our batteries included solution is known as Silk. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the networking on Silk, um, and then we can compare and contrast it with what the networking looks like on NSXT. So with the Silk, um, networking stack, every single container is now placed on an overlay network. This is a flat overlay network. Um, we assign a 10.255 slash 16 range. Um, I'm hoping everyone here knows what a CIDR range is, um, but, I, but essentially what, a, what an IP address block gives you is um, the ability to support 250 containers 
on 250 cells. Um, so that's the way to look at this IP address block. Um, it is configurable, so if you have existing networks and existing services that are already using this address, you can change it uh, to something that's also RFC 1918 compliant. Um, and all of this is, of course, documented in Pivotal documentation as well. Um, the parts that we didn't change are basically the access to the external network. So that is still going through the core router, it's still using NAT. And so everything that you're already used to doing with Cloud Foundry, none of that changes. The only thing this does it is that it enables a completely new use case, which is for direct container communication. So that was the data plane. Um, let's take a look at what the control plane looks like. And this is actually interesting because all the stuff you see in green is all the batteries included uh, components of, of networking. But when you think of something like NS6T coming in, you can basically swap all of that out and put in your own third party plugin. Um, so let me talk a little bit about, this is a, an extremely simplified diagram, by the way. Um, so when a container is created, uh, it calls out container runtime called Garden. Um, Garden has a component called the Garden External Networker, and that's, that is what exposes the actual CNI API and calls the uh, CNI plugin. Um, with the batteries included solution, we actually use uh, IP tables to do most of the enforcement. IP tables is a Linux kernel feature uh, that enables you to do firewalling in the Linux kernel. Uh, depending on your plugin, you might actually not use IP tables at all. You could do something completely different. Um, the second part of what we've built is actually policy, right? Um, in order to enforce policy, we have a new component called the policy server. And the policy server has both a CLI and an API. It has an external API that you can use, developers can use, um, operators can use to configure policies. And then an internal API that a plugin can basically pull to get the latest and greatest um, policies that, that need to be configured. And so our NSXT integration uses um, these components. So it, it uses the policy server, it uses the, the CNI API, as well as other components uh, like Cloud Controller and Diego. But we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go along. Um, the application policies part is basically um, abstracted away at the app level. So a Cloud Foundry app basically has a policy that can be assigned to it. So you can say, allow app A to talk to app B, and every single instance of that app automatically gets that policy assigned. So if you, you know, bring up, scale down, scale up your app, the policy is automatically applied. You don't have to reconfigure it again. You don't have to restart your apps as well. So that's kind of how the app level policies work. The policy config is really, really simple. It's basically either done through the CLI, which is currently uh, supports configuring policies for apps in the same space. You could also use the API to configure policies across spaces and orgs. So there's no restriction here. You could, you could have apps in different spaces and orgs talk to each other. And that was another like, you know, important thing for us to not restrict things to just a space or just an org. So it's really simple. Um, you ha just have to give the source app, the destination app, and um, in addition to that, the port and the protocol that you're talking on. Okay. Was there a question? Can we do that with uh, the batteries included option? Yes, so the question was, can we do that with the batteries included option? And yes, absolutely. So in the batteries included option, these policies will basically be uh, enforced by the VXLAN policy agent that I showed in, th in this slide, and it's going to program IP tables rules to enforce that policy. Yes, so the question was, can we do it in 1.10 or 1.11? You can do it in 1.11, uh, because 1.11 is when we went GA with the feature. In 1.10, container networking was still beta, and it was, you had to explicitly opt into it. So you could do it in 110, but you had to opt in, and it was, it's a beta feature. I see another question. Yeah, so you said you can do it across orgs and spaces, so is there just additional options to specify the orgs and space for each app? 
Um, so in the CLI, currently there is no option to add org and space. The, 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 the CLI policy is just for the current space and org that you're targeted to. Uh, we'll be enhancing that CLI in the future to also add org and space as options or perhaps even configuring policy based on an app name because then you don't care about like org and space. Um, so at, at, at that point, uh, you should be able to configure it through the CLI. But today, if you want to use the policy, you have to configure it through the API to be across uh, orgs and spaces. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I'll move on to, all right. I believe it's six dot three. Six dot thirty one. Uh, that's Angela. She's the anchor of our team. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's in it's in CLI version six dot thirty one. Originally, we did have uh, you you did need to use a CLI plugin to use this. So if you were on one eleven, you would have to use a CLI plugin to uh, configure policies. But with one twelve, we also had the CLI Go GA. And so you can use just the regular CFCLI to configure policies. Um, so another thing that this enables, which perhaps is not evident you know, right off the bat, is that you can now have support for UDP as well. So if you have apps that needed to use UDP, you can use container-to-container -container networking to satisfy that use case. And so we see things like clustering apps or apps that need to uh, communicate with each other directly using some sort of a UDP protocol can now start being deployed uh, to Cloud Foundry. Um, so that's another uh, key thing that the container-to-container -container networking and policy adds. Right, so the question was, is UDP routing already in 1.11? And so that's the important piece here, that through the router, you, don't, you did not have an option to actually do UDP routing. And that's still the case. Um, but because you have direct container-to-container -container communication, you can now do UDP traffic as well for those use cases, uh, for the use cases that are within the foundation and require UDP. So just want to touch upon a couple of different use cases that we've seen. Um, and if there are others, we'd really love to hear about them. Um, the, the main thing is around securing microservices. So if you have a whole bunch of microservices uh, that are today going out through the Go router and coming back in, securing those by giving them direct east-west communication, um, giving them the ability to not push an app with a route. So you can actually say CF push minus minus no route and then just have private microservices um, as well as the fine-grained uh, network policies. Um, so we do have two modes for configuring network policies. One is as network admin. The second is as a space developer. So it, it depends upon you know, your organization and how much self-service there is, but both these options are available. So as a developer, you would push an app and then you would say allow you know, or add network policy for this app to another app. The second use case that we see is around clustering apps. So this is usually a single application that has different instances that are trying to talk to each other. Um, and so we, 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 we see this as having like this, usually the same source and destination in the policy. So this is also possible with our policy. You can configure a policy that has the same source and the same destination as well. So it's pretty flexible that way. Um, We'll get into now the details of the NSXT integration, and we'll see how, it, how it's different uh, from what we just shared around the batteries included. Thank you. So NSXT offers like a significantly more deeper integration with Cloud Foundry, as I mentioned earlier. And this is based on the CNI integration interface that Usha introduced in the last section. So, NSXT, as I mentioned and I introduced a little, spoke about it a little earlier, is really, think of it as an SDN network, software-defined network, both for traditional and cloud-native apps. What I mean by that is it's basically 
you can connect container ba container based apps into that these containerized apps could be on cloud foundry they could be on kubernetes at the same time they, it's also a software defined network for traditional applications so for all of your traditional vm based infrastructure bare metal infrastructure it's basically one single network fabric so in addition to that it's also uh, for on premise and cloud based workloads so think of nsx as one single network fabric that's actually implemented completely in software so it's decoupled from the underlying physical infrastructure and uh, it's for all workloads cloud native and traditional workloads now the benefit of trying to what why are we doing something like this is right is as we, we the common trend that we've kind of been seeing in all of our customer environments is the emergence of the modern application uh, platform and proliferation of compute infrastructure so the two common things that we see in all of our customer environments and data centers is basically the leverage of more than one form of infrastructure so it could be vSphere and one form of public cloud for some customers it could be vSphere and bare metal if you're trying to do something with uh, containers so the, the network has to really the nsx network has to really evolve from being like a vSphere only network to being a network for all infrastructure and for all applications so that's really the idea so from an architectural standpoint it's not super different from nsx v uh, the or the precursor version which was for vSphere uh, but there are some differences and i'll go through some of them so the idea is nsx has a management plane and the management plane is like uh, has a bunch of apis and can be also leveraged using ui and the management plane is what we've been integrating NSX with other platforms, right? So think of them as integrating NSX with infrastructure as service platforms like OpenStack or VMware has our own infrastructure platform called vRealize Automation. That's what we've been doing for a bunch of time. But what we're doing now, really, right, for the last year and so, is being integrating NSX to the modern application platform. So if you have a PCF-based platform or a Kubernetes-based PKS platform, we're integrating the management plane of NSX with the application platform. So the idea is as developers deploy applications, uh, configure uh, microservices and upgrade them throughout the life cycle, there's like a seamless communication happening behind the scenes, right? Behind PKS and PCF, that's all talking to the management plane of NSX, okay? So the in addition to the management plane, uh, NSX ha also has the controller. Control, it's a scale-out active-active cluster, typically deployed as virtual appliances on top of vSphere or any form of IaaS infrastructure, and it's really the brain of the system. So it basically takes configuration state saying, hey, create a router, create a load balancer, create a firewall. And uh, it's basically going to take that and kind of go and figure out where these applications, VMs, or containers are running and push down that configuration state. So the data plane of NSX is a distributed data plane that runs at, in ESX, in KVM, right? So the KVM could be RHEL-based KVM, Ubuntu-based KVM, and it's also kind of now expanding to cloud, right? So we started with NSX and providing these capabilities for EC2 instances and working on other clouds right now. But the idea really is to have this distributed data plane across various form factors, and what we're really programming at the end of the day is a vSwitch, a virtual switch. So we're making the virtual switch, which in the past used to be a simple layer two device, to now become like a super rich uh, networking device that can do layer two, layer three firewalling, and in future, more advanced services like uh, even load balancing, right? Um, and the vSwitch in, in KVM is based on open vSwitch, uh, which is like an open, uh, open source uh, vSwitch. And on ESX, it's basically the ESX vSwitch. So in addition to this, NS, uh, the NSX also has the NSX Edge. So the NSX Edge is basically like our edge uh, network appliance, which talks to the physical routers and physical infrastructure, and it provides a bunch of services. So it provides an edge perimeter firewall, it provides load balancing capabilities, it provides routing capabilities. What's really, really interesting about NSX T and the Edge is uh, the fact that we can actually kind of uh, run this both in virtual form factors and bare metal form factors. And a significant amount of like engineering innovation has gone into like the bare metal edge, right? Because we, what we've done is we've taken like the open source Nginx 
and taken DPDK and kind of built this super high performance general purpose uh, device which can do routing, firewall, and load balancing at DPDK speed styles. So it's not really an interrupt driven system, it's a pole mode system. So think of every um, Linux server giving you like a 40 gig load balancer and 40 gig firewall where you can actually run multiple services, right? It can, you can run load balancing, routing, and firewall on a box, and it's kind of giving you 40 gig to the network. So it's a very, very high performant ingress and egress into the cloud. And it has an impact when you kind of define, design your entire data center infrastructure behind like an NSXT bare metal based edge. So massive amount of engineering investment and innovation going there, okay? So why bother about NSX, right? Like NSXT, NSXV has been there for quite a long time. It kind of does some things. There's some amount of people here configuring, using it. A lot more people out there using NSX. So, so in the, to kind of give you guys some context, it's been about like four and a half years in the market and NSX has gone from like, when I joined $5 million to now, it's now $900 million business. So it's a hugely successful platform out there. Why should I kind of look at something new? Right? So the reasons for doing that is one is basically uh, NSXT, as I said, is a platform built ground up for microservices. So it actually has this full-fledged integration into uh, Kubernetes-based platforms and Cloud Foundry platform. So NSXT had a release in uh, September where we, we GA'd the integration into Kubernetes and we're now working with the Cloud Foundry team to integrate, uh, to release this integration for Cloud Foundry apps. The benefit is for infrastructure teams, it gives you a calm, single platform to kind of manage networking, security, load balancing in a completely software-defined approach for traditional and cloud data apps across any infrastructure. So that's the reason why there is a massive amount of interest. And I saw a number of hands go up today as well uh, with respect to interest on NSXT. And with respect to micro-segmentation, what's really unique is a number of customers told us that we really want to extend this concept of micro-segmentation to a microservice, right? So the idea is as you kind of take your big uh, Java-based applications or other even other applications running on like WebSphere and WebLogic and kind of decompose them into microservices, you will have actually a lot of microservices running in your infrastructure and your sheer uh, footprint of uh, APIs is going to kind of grow. So securing such infrastructure on an app by app basis might become more complex. So you really need an infrastructure that's super well integrated into an application platform. So where you create an application, it, it, it by default comes up with like security. So that's the reason we have seen interest in the last like 18 months on this area. How many people here are interested in micro segmentation for microservices or is that, or that, is that like the area of interest for NSXT here? Okay. Okay. So that's quite a common uh, pa paradigm that we've seen, right? A lot of customers, they're kind of dabbling with uh, microservices, built like the first couple of applications out there, want to commit to like a full-fledged uh, micro program to kind of like uh, modernize these apps. While they do that, they want to kind of look at, rethink about how they do security. And that's where basically, and most of these apps always talk uh, to traditional infrastructure, right? So that's where these use cases are talking about. So the common thing that we've seen in most environments is basically most customers have like multiple foundations, have legacy applications, and are looking for a way where they can easily kind of deploy these applications, bring them online, but configuring security takes a lot of time, right? Because you're talking to traditional infrastructure teams. And at that point, you're basically kind of raising tickets. So while it's super awesome to have an amazing application platform, it does not make sense if you have a not so super amazing uh, in infrastructure for networking and security. So that's the reason I'm, uh, problem statement that we're trying to address. So anytime you kind of deploy an application, the application could be talking to like an other microservice running in some other Kubernetes cluster or some other Cloud Foundry cluster. It could be talking to a backend uh, database. We want to make the process of provisioning security around this super simple. So that's what we're trying to do, okay? So, um, and we've kind of trying to support like two different uh, approaches to configuring this, this as well, right? So the idea really is if you kind of use Cloud Foundry as like platform as like the, the source of truth, you can use the Cloud Foundry API to configure all of this security. Some of the operations teams that we've kind of dealt with all felt like, you know, we wanted to have uh, the ability to configure security on NSX because it gives us the ability to do this for both traditional and like modern apps. So when we kind of release this product, uh, uh, in, in, in a few weeks, the idea is really is to support two means to configuring security. One is basically using NSX 
manager, which is a management plane of plans, or using NSX APIs. But at the same time, you can also use the CF network policy. So I'll kind of switch to like a demo and uh, show you show what, what we're trying to do, right? So before I kind of show the demo, like let's talk a little about what this demo is. So the idea is there's a Cloud Foundry Foundation. You're trying to deploy an application. And the application has like a front end and a back end, right? Um, what we'd want to show is basically as you kind of go create an org in Cloud Foundry and deploy an application, we want to show network automation, right? So that's the goal. We don't want software, manual, ticket-based network provisioning. At the same time, we also want security for the microservice. So what we're going to show is when you deploy this application, by default, actually your front end here is not going to be able to talk to your back end. And only when you provision a Cloud Foundry network policy, uh, the front end is able to talk to the back end. Okay? So that's the goal of the demo. And what we're showing is NSXT 2.1, which is currently in the works, and hopefully GA in a couple of weeks. And it's integration with PCF 2.0, which is also in the works. Okay? So what we have here on the left is basically like the Cloud Foundry interface. So the idea is the Cloud Foundry user should really not care about whether there is NSX or not in the back. The idea is to keep it very simple to, for them. And as you go and provision apps and orgs on Cloud Foundry, there's dynamic provisioning of networking and security on NSX. So that's the goal, right? So what, what you're seeing here on the right is NSX T interface. It's basically got these services like switching, routing, firewall. And what we're going to do, the first step is really you know, to create this org, right? Which is called Cats and Dogs. And uh, we're going to provision like a front end app in that. And when you go and do that, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to dynamically provision like network. We're going to create a software defined network for a Cloud Foundry org, right? So, and we're going to kind of uh, also allocate IP addresses for your Cloud Foundry app. So what you're seeing here is basically NSX dynamically created a port. So a port is the equivalent of the application instance. So every AI has this equivalent NSX logical port. And we're dynamically provisioning logical ports when you create AIs or when Cloud Foundry creates AIs. And from an operator perspective, we're also tagging those resources. So for every logical port, you actually get to see which org, which space, which foundation that logical port lives in. So what, what's happening there is the font is a little small, but you pushed an app front end. It went into staging. So NSX created a staging uh, logical port. And then eventually, basically, the, uh, the port got deleted and the running container was created. So NSX now has basically created a logical port for the front end app and has basically tagged all of the logical port with a lot of metadata coming from Cloud Foundry, the org name, space name, app name, et cetera. So when you do that, what it does is it gives you the ability to configure security around the metadata of the application, right, or application level security. So we, we push the front end. Now let's go and actually push the back end. Right? So the idea really is to demonstrate that when you push two CF apps, by default, they'll not be able to talk to each other. Right? So there is network uh, zero trust being deployed. And then you have to enable access by configuring network policies. So the second step really is like to push the back end. And NSX is doing similar things. It says, OK, Cloud Foundry has this uh, back end AI being provisioned. I need to wire it to the network that I created for this specific org. Let me go do that and hook the application instance to the NSX network. So the key thing really is from a CF platform user perspective, their experience is 100% the same. So they don't really know or care uh, if NSX is backing this Cloud Foundry Foundation. So the idea is to keep the developer experience the same, but at the same time give operations teams the ability to enforce policy. Okay, so we pushed the backend, and NSX now have basically has done this IP allocation where it's allocated an IP address to the backend AI. It's done a bunch of tagging to say, you know what, we have this backend container. So now what you see is you have two, two a frontend AI and a backend AI. Both of them are reachable right from the external environment, but these two microservices cannot talk to each other because. That's how we provision the network infrastructure by default. So if you, if you have two microservices, they can't talk to each other. So what you need, so you, when the front end tries to talk to the back end, what you're getting is basically like a bad response, a failed request. So I'm expecting cats, but what we saw there was dogs. Now, 
the reason why that's happening is that by default, we are actually provisioning these deny rules. So what's happening is this is the NSX firewall, the distributed firewall, which is applied on a per container or a per application instance granularity, and it's dropping traffic, basically denying traffic between the front end and back end. But if you go to a Cloud Foundry and actually configure a policy where you enable your front end to talk to your back end, dynamically what's happening is a firewall rule is being provisioned by NSX uh, on, on this infrastructure. Right? So you're actually going and the, a security group was created for the front end, a security group was created for the back end, and we basically uh, added the AIs or the logical ports to those security groups, and then we also went and configured a firewall rule which said the front end can uh, talk to the back end on a specific TCP port. So policy-driven access between microservices and a principle of zero trust or no access between microservices by default. So now the front end is kind of talking to this cats and dogs application and is expecting a cat because the right policy is configured, he's able to access the cat. Uh, and this is not just kind of applied during the creation of the application, but it's also throughout the life cycle of the application, right? So as the application is created, uh, scaled up, scaled down, uh, deleted, this, this integration is basically dynamically provisioning all of the firewall rules. So the idea really is you get security, but you don't necessarily get slowed down by the need for having security because it's all integrated into the application platform. So that's, that's, that's the problem statement we're trying to solve. Um, and this can be configured for any types of application services, right? It could be HTTP services, it could be TCP-based application, UDP-based application, it actually does not matter, right? So I'll kind of switch this around. So does that idea of application-level microservices make sense? Any questions on that? Yeah. How native is that to the implement? Is it an application security group that gets implemented in heaven sex? Um, is there automation around accessing like an Oracle database? Not right now. So the way we, so I'll answer some part of it and I'll let Usha also answer to, uh, to part of it because it's also related to Cloud Foundry. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, there are two different approaches for configuring security. One is using the Cloud Foundry Network Policy API, which is what we kind of demonstrated. The other is using NSX APIs directly, right? So when you use NSX APIs directly, you can create security groups for like an Oracle server, a security group for like a mainframe, and then also you can, you can create these security groups for CF apps. If you kind of looked at it for every logical port or application instance that we created, we tagged it. So NSX has this security group mechanism which is based on tagging. So you can basically say front end, back end, ERP system, and create just rules based on these three security groups. And then any time you provision an application, only when you provision it with the right name, your front back end might be able to kind of write to your ERP system. So the NSX API driven mechanism gives you the ability to do this across Cloud Foundry and back end application services potentially extending that to even like Kubernetes, right? You can extend that basically policy to apps running in other uh, platforms. On the CF side- Yeah, you... can I just add to that? Yeah. So you, you can actually configure application security groups to do egress rules, yeah. and they'll be enforced by NSX. Yeah. But if you're looking for the next level where you actually have ingress rules on your database that are being enforced, that's possible now with this NSX manager integration. So Correct. there is, you know, there's, th there is additional functionality that you're getting there. Plus, the NSX rules can be applied to the app, where, whereas the ASGs are applied to that uh, space, space typically. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything you wanted to add, Usha? Keep going. That's it. Okay. Go to the next. Um, one. So how is this configured? So we're building an Ops Manager tile, Ops Manager integration. So we're going to bring the NSX tile. And the idea is you import the NSX tile into Opsman, you initialize it with information about the NSX manager, and it's basically going to go to deploy like the integration component between like NSX and Cloud Foundry components. It's called NSX Container Plugin. So that's really the component that connects NSX manager and uh, Cloud Foundry en environments like policy server, um, cloud controller, et cetera. And once you provision the NSX tile, you then provision the ERT. ERT. 
So essentially, so we need a integration, management plane integration between the Cloud Foundry system and the NSX manager. So, so yeah, you have to in, in, initiate, instantiate NSX manager, uh, FQDN, IP address, username, password, uh, what IP addresses that you want to use for your Cloud Foundry apps, et cetera, there are a few bunch of parameters. So, so the tile also includes uh, the ability to install the CNI plugin on the cells. Correct. Um, as well as the policy enforcement, uh, OBS, things like that. So, Correct. so all the things that are required to basically enable this NSX integration uh, with the PCF do get installed. So there's a management plane integration and a data plane integration. So on every Diego cell, basically there's an NSX policy agent, open vSwitch, CNI plugin that need to be instantiated. And then you also need the management plane connectivity, which is called the NSX container plugin. Okay, yes? So we're starting to pro bring, bring this integration first for vSphere, so that's what we're doing. But the idea is, we haven't kind of designed that yet, but you could think of uh, the same tile doing those things as well. You, one tile regardless of one platform. Yeah, yeah. So one NSX tile, this NSX tile is right now just instantiating the components for vSphere, it could instantiate it even in the context of other clouds, other infrastructure. Six five. It's a prerequisite. Uh, six five is a prerequisite. Okay. okay. Um, from an architecture standpoint, right? I just mentioned this a second ago, and you, you guys asked for it as well. So the NSX container plugin is the management plane integration, right, with the policy server VM. Uh, so that's what's being provisioned by that tile. At the same time, the NSX CNI plugin and the node agent, there are pieces of software that runs inside every Diego cell, is also being provisioned by the tile. And the NSX container plugin basically kind of takes all of this configuration state about network policies, orgs, and spaces. It talks to the NSX manager and controller. Eventually, all of that state gets pushed down to this agent called NSX node agent. And it's what configures the uh, open vSwitch on, on, on every Diego cell. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Is there uh, an ability to expose a container for ingress directly from an external entity into the same VM content? So, for, to, y yes. So, like, like, let, let me qu tell you how the routing model works. With this was a high level introduction. What we really do is basically uh, provisions like NSX software defined networks, they get attached to an NSX router, and the NSX router could do NAT or it can just be completely routed, which means that you can actually get an application instance on your data center routed infrastructure, and you can directly talk to it if you choose to. At a network level, you can choose, you can directly talk to it, yes. So I could have an external entity in a deployed container directly? At a network level, yes. So because NSX, it, the traffic comes to like an NSX router, and NSX router says, you know, I need to talk to this network spawn for org A and basically it tries to reach that container, so yes. So you basically get direct IP reachability both into the container and out of the container. From a networking standpoint, the container is now no different from any VM or bare metal server. So that's the key thesis of trying to build some, some of this. Um, if you restart the app, it will preserve the IP because the AI likely might not be deleted. So the, the IP is tied to the AI. So, so the primary unit is the application instance, and the application instance maps to a logical port on NSX. That's our primary abstraction. And the logical port has an IP. So as long as the AI, so the IP follows the AI lifecycle. So the AI is deleted, the IP is given back to the pool. So NSX is also an IPAM system. So, we, so you basically kind of take an IP block and you say this is like, so you, one aspect that we didn't touch upon is you can have a model with where you design a completely routed infrastructure, which means that your container networks are not natted at all. They're directly routed networks within your data center network. That's one model. The other model is all of this sits behind like an NSX NAT router, 
So you have all of these application containers running behind an MSX NAT router. So that's the two models. But there's no cell level NAT in, or any of that form. Okay. So this is soon to be GA. By the end of the year, we, we're going to GA this stuff. Uh, if you're interested to learn more or if you want to try P to do POCs of the stuff, feel free to reach out to like Pivotal or VMware and we're more than happy to help. And if you have other use cases and other things, we're super interested to learn. Okay? Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much.